Rolling. Okay. I'm rolling. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, being here. It's great to it's see you. It's my pleasure. I've always wanted to meet you. I guess I'd like to start by asking you about what it was like growing up in Centralia, about your childhood. What was it like? In it's one of the reasons I like to come back. Mm -hmm. It's God's country. They're real people. Not that they're everywhere else as fake people, but you just found a, a higher degree of, of real people. Almost every person you met had something to teach you, and, and I was taught plenty. Well, I was going to ask you how that influenced your career in public life. Well, uh, one of the things was that it seems like every mother or father on the street was your parent. If you did something they saw you did, do it, and they called your parents, you got home and said, I understand today you did such and such to the library, and you think, God, how can they be everywhere? But they were. Real networking, I had, guess. Had, had, had a whole network set up. What about, you know, we hear an awful lot about small town values and how at a very basic level they really tell us what's best about America. How do those values in Centralia shape, uh, shape your outlook and get you on your path? Number one, a firm belief in you're going to get caught. If you're going to do something, you'll be caught. Mm -hmm. In terms of, um, how about hard work? A lot of that. That, that was a, a big thing that was poured into the brew down there. Mm -hmm. There probably were a lot of people who served as role models when you were growing up. Um, and just if you tell me about some of those kinds of folks and what kind of what kind of impact they had on you as uh, as you grew up. Well, I think uh, my biggest role model was my mother. Uh, she can see I straight into politics, and uh, she was the first woman elected to the office of precinct committee man in the state of Illinois. Usually, the precinct committee woman was appointed by the fellow who was elected precinct committee man. But not, not mother, she ran on her own, mounted the campaign and was elected. So she was not a committee woman, she was a precinct committee man. What year was that? I guess I spoke too quickly when I said, this is not one, since it's about me, I'm gonna have to study for it. <laughs> I'd say it was probably early 40s. Mm -hmm. Well, you were born in 1940s. So That's correct. That was after you were born. Now everyone knows how old I am. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so it sounds like you sort of got uh, politics at the breakfast table then, like a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And lunch and dinner. What kind, of what kinds of discussions did you have in your family about politics when you were growing up? Oh, my mother would say, Senator so-and-so is coming in tomorrow and you're going with me to meet him. Or her, mm -hmm. and uh, or next week I'm going to Springfield, and you're coming with me. What kinds of people did you meet? Could you give me an idea of some of the characters and the figure, political figures you met? Well, uh, my mother's first cousin was the administrative assistant to Congressman Charles W. Versell from the old 23rd District of Illinois, which George Shippey is the current pew holder in. Mm -hmm. And uh, anytime we went to Salem, I went over to see Congressman Purcell, my mother's cousin Susan, doing her job as administrative assistant. I was, I like to see what she did, what she administered as administrative assistant. I found out it was considerable. Mm -hmm. So you got an appreciation. Yes, and on. and then I aspire to that, that lofty office myself. Did you run? Or no, 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 that no. was a, that was an appointment. That that's one that that you you run someone's campaign and then uh, because they like all the hard work you did for no pay, they said, here come in and sit in this chair and do this. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you went to the University of Illinois. You have yes, a degree sir. In and I also taught down here at SIU. Well, I didn't know that. Tell me about that. I taught government and economics. When was that? About ten years ago. Hmm. Government and economics. Yes, at Carbondale? sir. 
Yes, sir. Work for Jack Isakoff, which I'm sure is still a legend around here. There's probably a lot of difference between teaching politics and actually practicing it, isn't there? A world of difference. In fact, it's, it's perhaps two different things. Could you give me a concrete example of how, how the two differ? Well, perhaps the best one I can give you just tell you they're different. What interested you so much in public service, in the life of politics, beyond, beyond the, the, the high pay we got? I think that's the first thing that drew me away from journalism. I finally found a career in which I could make more money uh, being in public service than I could than a, as a reporter. Well, the two are usually at odds, aren't they, journalists and, pol and politicians? Uh, with the exception of the people for whom I worked. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, President Reagan never saw an adversarial relationship between the press corps and what he was doing in his presidency. Mm -hmm. He saw it as an extension. And he says, uh, Brady, he says, we got to bring this into every, every person's home this evening so that they'll hear about it and not read about it by some pundit who, who doesn't know what I'm talking about. He's a remarkable man in many yes. respects. Yes, yes. Would you mind telling me about your relationship with him? Well, uh, I was also fortunate to have been John Connolly's press secretary. And uh, along with, with my uh, keen work and $12 million, we got him one delegate at the convention. <laughs> and. Uh, for four years, I had to put up with being the only, quote, non-Texan, unquote, in the damn campaign. And then I go from there to becoming the only non-Californian in, in the Reagan entourage. Okay, I was going to say, Illinois step up with another Mr. Lincoln, with, with another president, so I can be back home and say, I'm not a non, I am. I'm the real, the real item. What was Mr. Reagan like to work for? The dream. Intelligent. And uh, all these canards you heard that, that after lunch he'd go into the office next to the Oval Office and sleep. No, no. He was, he was usually coming into my office to get butter, something like that or going from floor to floor to make sure that everyone was doing something that was productive. I can remember the first thing that he told us when we came in there, he got all the special assistants together. He said, the first one I see with their feet on the furniture is out of here. Because we had seen a prior administration and a lot of the pictures were taken in the office, you know, head back, lean back in the chair with the feet up on the desk, he says, uh, he said, we don't own this place. We're merely stewards of this place. And people will judge our stewardship by how well we left the campsite when we leave it. And I, and I heard that a lot in Boy Scouts, that we always tried to make the campsite look better when we left it than it was when we found it. And you'd, uh, you'd, you'd get some, some what we call squaw wood the kind of small wood that you use and could use one match and once you got the squall wood going it would set a log on fire you could build your fire and we'd put some of that under some rock somewhere so that anyone coming in there who had been caught in the rain and was pulling their canoes off the lake we'd say aha look what someone did here for us we can dry out now leaving the place better than when you came yes. in any uh, any other thoughts about Mr. Reagan that uh, that you think would be uh, a lot of us only know him from what we've seen on television. Well, what you saw was what he was. I mean, he didn't uh, go in and put on you know fake fur or something like that and come out as something different. He was what he said and what he was. What you saw was what we got. How do you think historians will uh, evaluate his role? Um, I think uh, historians will, will look upon it 
kindly and with respect. Because uh, from the day we got in there, he had an agenda. He knew where we were going, and he knew some ways that he tried in California how to get there. And there were ways that, that we didn't know. And he taught us those ways. How did that uh, how did that come about in practical terms from something he would think about to actually being translated into policy? Well And your role in that too as I think about that. I was a good listener. And I took good notes also. Uh for example, um if uh, prisons were having trouble getting all the laundry done and all that, who did he bring in? He brought people who were in the hotel and the motel business. Uh, they get the sheets and everything done every day for their tour. People come in and change the sheets on the bed. And uh, the same thing with uh, there are millions of government cars out there, probably too many government cars out there. He brought in the pe people from Hertz and Avis, mm -hmm. and they knew how to get them service, how to set up a rotation plan, you know, how to bring one off the road, take it in, and and do. Uh, I don't know why I can say this or not. A, a, a Jeffy Lube number on it, you know, mm -hmm. how to have all the maintenance, first echelon maintenance that needed to be done to that vehicle done so that it would it would run 15 or 25 more years. Being in the White House, um, I'm curious as to, you know, you've had an opportunity now to see it from both sides, from the outside looking in and, and vice versa. How much... Um, I'm doing a lot of seeing it from the outside now. By, yeah, I can imagine. How, uh, how much does the, does the president, any president for that matter, know what's going on in the lives of the people of the country and how they feel about things beyond the polls? Well, uh, Mrs. Reagan and, and President Reagan worked as a team. And she didn't have to go to the, do the shopping for the mess every day, but she still was a shopper. And, and he'd go along, he'd say, my God, he said, this was 15 cents last week. 75 cents a day. She said, sure, honey, come over here and look at this. These melons were a nickel last week, and look what they are. They're twenty-five today. And, uh, so you know, the, the same thing the housewife was feeling when she'd say, are these prices ever going to go down? He said, he'd call his, his people in and say, what are ways that we can make these prices go down? For you, what was the what was the biggest challenge being his his press secretary? Well, you probably read about it in the New York Times. Uh, he had gotten in a lot of trouble with environmentalists by saying that that trees were perhaps one of the largest pollutants on on the planet, and here we are in Arbor Day going out planting trees and all of that. He said because they they produce. Uh, uh, oc nitrogen oxide and uh, we were flying over to Louisiana one day and there was this huge forest fire on them. and here, here was all this smoke going like that and I got a pal of mine who rode up in the front with me in the plane and I said Kachigan come here look at that killer trees <laughs> and Hal Raines was the only member of the press corps put that in the New York Times uh, I remember Bill Casey who became our director of CIA, called the house and said, Brady, the plane's going out at 5.15 out of Dallas. He said, I don't know why I'm bothering to tell you, telling you this, because you're not going to be on it. And uh, Stu Spencer was the uh, director of political operations at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the press, who would, could who could always come up to my table where I sat, and, and I would do a, a briefing right up there, where they were finally beginning to get to Stu, driving crazy. And he says, you've got to get Brady back on this plane. He says, I don't have time to do my own work. I'm doing his work and trying to do mine and, and trying to plan ahead. And he said, either that or we're going to have to find a, 
uh, four by eight sheet of plywood and nail it between this door between the coach part of the plane and the first class part of the plane. And so I remember me says, uh, Brady, you're a person again. Plane's going out at 515 out of Dallas. Be on it. <laughs> I imagine there are a lot of stories like that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't use killer trees again. No, no, no more killer trees. I vocabulary, I hacked it off and <laughs> threw it away. Um, you've been an inspiration to many people in the years following the assassination attempt. Um, what, what sustained you in that struggle toward rehabilitation and your work? How about the alternative? Uh, I wasn't ready for him to dig a hole and throw me in and then throw dirt on me. I was not ready for that. And uh, I know that I, I'm not the one that says when I come and when I go. But uh, I remember my neurosurgeon saying to my wife, Sarah, or as I call her, the raccoon, told the raccoon, says, your husband has a tremendous will to live. And he did. He said he's fighting, fighting all the way. And so I think if he was going to take me, that perhaps would have been the easiest time to do it. I would have offered, uh, or was in a position to offer perhaps the least resistance. But evidently I had more resistance there than I thought I could gin up. Mm -hmm. What about family and friends and how they helped? Well, it, one of the great things is all the people that I went to school with in Century, I'm still close to. We're still pals and still go out and, and knock one back every now and then. Or, or shoot hoops or do that sort of thing. And uh, is that a signal for me? No, I'm, I'm giving signals to the camera, sorry. Okay, and I saw that, and I, and I thought... Uh, no, 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 just ignore me. I'm, I'm controlling those two. Right? I thought it was perhaps an audible at the line of scrimmage. <laughs> <laughs> but you were saying that you still like to go to... You still have friends from your Centralia days. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, I, I would know... If I drive into Centralia, I'd know where to find them right now. They'd be at the Green Grill. Mm. How, how important was the was the role of faith in your recovery? Very important. Could you talk about that? Yes. Um, um, I told my doctor, I says, I'm not as far back as I'm going to come. He said, oh, really? He said, how do you know what else you're going to do? And I said, watch this space. He said, do you really believe that? And I said, yes, I believe it, because if I didn't believe it, it wouldn't happen, would it? And he said, not a bit. I said, I believe it, and it's going to happen. And I have seen myself being able to do more things than, than you know, when it just kind of stopped there for a while. And all of a sudden, I started doing new things. And there was a man up there that was saying, Brady, today you're going to be able to do this. You do a lot of work with groups that work with the disabled. Uh, what what kind of message do you give to other people? I usually tell people that are in a chair walking with a cane two things. One, uh, persevere, because it's always darkest before the dawn. I didn't didn't know the day that I was going to walk. Mm. I, I know what precipitated it, though. Is they were physical physical terrorists. And uh, they used to beat on me and have more fun with me, you know, throw me or, around like uh, Punchy the Clown or something like that. And uh, I said, Do you, are you people with it enough that I can make a deal with you? And their chief says, I've been trying to get him to walk. Try it and make a deal. <laughs> I said, if you'll leave me alone for 10 minutes, I'll walk today. And they said, okay, and they all kind of backed off. And uh, I said, where are the parallel bars? And they said, over there. And I went, thum, 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 right down the bars. And they all clapped. And then they started all coming around again. I said, wait a minute. I said, 10 minutes. And their chief says, by my watch, he still has seven more minutes. 
I mean, you know, they could stay away from me for three minutes, mm -hmm. and then you don't want to get back in and beat on him again. I have a feeling a lot of what helped was your sense of humor as well. And the, and the second thing I tell people is to keep your sense of humor. Because if I can remember doing the things I was told to do and, you know, would have a pratfall or something like that, if I got so stuffy and so wrapped up in, you know, what I was thinking about this, I would have never been able to do it. But, you know, every now and then I'd have a good laugh at myself. Just sit down and say, Brady, you messed that one up. Um, you've seen the, uh, the disabilities issue from the perspective of a policymaker in the White House and now as a person with a disability. We have the Americans with Disabilities yes, Act. Yes, sir, I know. What more needs to be done as far as, uh, as that issue? What areas well, ADA is working. I travel three days a week, and that's, that's, that's almost a killer in itself. And I've noticed that the transportation in industry, trains, airlines, uh, buses, and people like that are doing all they can to make it easier for a person that's physically challenged to travel. And uh, there's still one thing. I, we, we went out and talked to the people at Northwest Airlines, and I said, Hey, uh, you know, I'm not a piece of baggage. You know, they say, we're now going to take rows 19 through 56 and board them. I said, you want to get loaded now? I said, not till I get on the plane. <laughs> but I mean, you, you're, you're a piece of freight. Load him. Mm -hmm. All right, if you can bring it out here, that's fine. <laughs> it's an attitudinal thing. Is, remembering their people. There, 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 there's, there's a lot of it, yeah. Uh, we're not second-class citizens. We still have a lot to give as becoming a laureate. You'll find out, you'll find out what we can do. Mm -hmm. When I talk to prospective employers, I say, hire us. We'll surprise the hell out of you. If you would, this four had a driver, if you had have to see what I would have to do to get to the metro to get into to work. I mean, it was clever. You know, it was like you were in OSS or something like that. Mm -hmm. you, you'd get in there. But now with the driver, it's being able to get to my driveway. Mm -hmm. And he takes it from there, takes the chair, and I have a uh, platform that comes out in the van, and I roll on it, and the platform goes up. And uh, the... Uh, the van is one of these kneeling vans. It goes down, you know, like a camel kneels down to where it's three inches off the ground. And then when the thing goes back in, the back door shuts, it goes back up to normal van height. That's ingenious. Yes, it is. And, and I say things to it. I'll say, kneel down, van. And it goes, <laughs> or up now, van, up, 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 up. When you're working for uh, groups like the National Organization on Disability and uh, National Head Injury Foundation, what, what primary role do you take with those groups as an advocate? Well, I do a lot of advocating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have different roles at, at both places, uh, and both of them have different goals and objectives. and. Uh, spend a lot of time on the hill and I haven't found a member yet that won't let me in their their office so there's good support there mm-hmm and and I can call them up and I get right through one of my pet peeves is on the hill the receptionist will say I don't know whether he's in you just want to say you want to you know pull off your wily e. coyote fur and say now, let, set the phone down, go in and look inside his office. If he's behind the desk, he's in. Or has he passed you in the last five minutes and said, I'm going downstairs to the carryout and I'll be back in a moment? I mean, the, the offices are, you could put 15 congressmen in the space that you have in here based on, you know, how much square foot mm -hmm. a congressman is given. Mm -hmm. Even Sonny Bono would say, they've given me the Taj Mahal. 
he didn't know that the way you get your office is that you have a staff person come over and put in a number and then they shake this thing up and they draw the number out and says Bono you've got office 4126 in, in the Cannon office building or you've got one of the big offices in the Rayburn building they're all about the same uh, people like the Rayburn building because the AA has an office in the Rayburn building about the size of the members office and the member just has to learn to live with that. I'd like to turn turn the attention now to, to gun control. Uh, yes, the, sir. Of course, the Brady Bill bears your name. What do you think about those in Congress now who, who are trying to repeal the law or, or got it? They're crazy. More guns means more violence. More violence means more carnage. More people in one of these things and walking around with a stick. And they're also uh, talking a game about doing the same thing with the ban on assault weapons. Just what we need are weapons of war on our streets. The police are outgunned now. You're going to give somebody an AR-15, an AK-47? Not. I hunt and I shoot trap and I shoot skeet. I sure as hell wouldn't want to be in the woods with someone in there hunting squirrel with an AK-47. And the range on one of those things about seven miles. You know, you're in the woods and the guy says, there he is. <laughs> and if it misses you or a tree or something, uh, if there's a playground or something over there like that, or someone taking their trash out on the other side of the woods, you know, bang. Being a victim is no fun. And I'm not going to get maudlin on you, so don't worry. But I'm just telling you, folks, let's don't fool around with these things. A lot of the critics are running ads in today's newspaper. I noticed that, you know, come out and harass him. I've been harassed that. before, and I've been harassed by the best of them. And I've, I've learned it goes with the territory. And uh, other than... When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the thing that I think of in my own mind. They look at it differently. Yes, we, lo we lose 15 children a day from, from firearms in this country. 15 a day. That's, that's more than, than our loss in Sweden or in the United Kingdom in a day. You know, of, of any age, not just children. Eight. Does it frustrate you as a Republican that a lot of members of your own party are, are pushing so hard for this now? Yeah, but I don't think it's really a party thing. I think they, they, they got all uh, sanguine on this silly contract with America. I mean, I think there's some things that, that are good, and there are a lot of things in it that I don't think are all that good. I'm curious about that. What what advice would you give to Mr. Gingrich and Senator Dole? Uh, well, I think Dole's busy now, <laughs> and he's going to continue to be busy for a while. Mm -hmm. And Gingrich may want to, at some point, go back to Cobb County, Georgia, and live under the the laws that he passed or didn't pass, or had passed or didn't have passed. And I don't think. Mr. Gingrich wants to do that. Not even if he could whisper it in Connie Chung's ear. As we move to the end, I'm curious, you know... I might say one thing on please. that. I think uh, uh, she more or less bagged Nudie's mommy on that. You think so? You know, I think anyone that had been around would not have fallen for you, you whispered mayor, and it'll just be between us, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ducks will fly out of your tush. <laughs> You've come a long way from Centralia uh, to the White House and, and beyond that. A lot of young people will probably be watching this program. Um, what sort of advice would you give uh, kids growing up today in Illinois about reaching their goals and, and living a full and satisfying life? Stay in school, do your homework, study hard, 
I always had nuns across the street that, uh, you know, would look and see what times our lights went on or off. And they would know whether I was doing homework or not. I think they had some. So anyway. Okay. We got speed. Okay, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's get a wide shot. Yeah. Uh, okay. This one. Actually, you let's get a, a yeah, both, both you get a wide shot. Okay. I got a band-aid. Flag is really... Yeah, that's good. Yeah, well, that's not there. Okay. Okay. Okay, rolling? Mm-hmm. Okay, five, four, three. Hand on the left a little there, Tom. Hold. Okay, see a little looser? Hold. Okay, go. A lot of young people may be watching this and thinking, so. and thinking about where they want to be in a few years. What advice would you give them as someone from a small town about realizing their dreams and living a full and satisfying life? Well, that being from a small town is not an impediment. If, if anything, it's a plus. Because they know you've seen the whites of people's eyes, you, you've been in the trenches, and uh, People have seen you, they've watched you. Stay in school, do your homework, study hard, and uh, go on from, from uh, elementary school. Go as far as you can go. I can remember uh, my father worked for the railroad and we weren't, we weren't the richest people in the town, although uh, he told me that during the Depression, it was perhaps one of the best jobs to have. He ne never was worried about uh, being out on the, on the pavement, selling apples or pencils or something like that. But uh, when I went to the University of Illinois, I remember they'd save money and I got $75 to go. But also, uh, and you probably still have it at SIU, where they have legislative scholarships. But I said, go see Senator so-and-so. I don't think he's giving his scholarship away. So that took care of my tuition right there. And they also had a county examination. Do you still have the county examination? No, we don't have that. Uh, you go to the county courthouse on a certain day, they give the examination. And my father was in World War I, so my category was dependent of World War I veteran. And you know, all, all 50 of us in the United States <laughs> would compete against one another. And I got it through the academic uh, examination as well as the legislative scholarship. Seeing some of those people that mother would say, I'm gonna take you in to see Representative so-and-so today. See. What goes around comes around. It all it all comes back. And did I have a clue at the time that at, at some point that was gonna pay my way through school? No, but it did. That's a great story. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. you. I've enjoyed it very much. I did too. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. And you, when you end here, go, go ahead and shake hands again. Okay. Tom, stay wide on the two shot. What I want you to do is, is, is really try and find out from him, Jack. Becoming a uh, Lincoln Laureate wasn't something that, that he aimed to do. It just sort of happened. But now that it has happened to him, mm -hmm. he's being recognized. What does that recognition mean to him? Uh, does it uh, validate everything that he's gone through, all the... Uh, trials and tribulations with uh, disability, with the uh, Brady Act, with the um, uh, things that he's done since then. Because I'm sure you could have just retired on a pension and said, oh, the heck with it. There was, there was one group that hoped that I'd just stay home and watch the Home Shopping Network or, you know, go to our beach house and just stay there. But I said, no, not my work here is not finished. Hmm. So is the... Uh to paraphrase David's question, um, how, is this is this sort of a capstone of achievement? Um, certainly, uh, got a lot more to do down the line. Well, uh, I'm so proud. I, I'm, I'm bursting my buttons, and uh, when I found out that uh, they were going to ask us to speak for three minutes, 
I was writing some remarks at home, and I have a 16-year-old son named Scott. And Scott says, Daddy, just tell him it blows you away. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think he put it in the, in the phraseology of the day. I am blown away. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. That's a good one. Okay.